So I, I want to introduce our, our wonderful guest speaker today, <coughs> Nara Milanich. Nara is an associate professor at history at Barnard College. She earned her BA from Brown and her uh, MA and PhD from Yale University. Her scholarly interests include modern Latin America and the comparative histories of family, childhood, and gender <coughs> law and social inequality. In 2009, Professor Milanich's book, Children of Fate, Childhood Class and the State in Chile, Chile, 1850 to 1930, was published by Duke University Press. So Children of Fate received the Grace Abbott Book Award from the Society for the History of Children and Youth. Uh, she also co-edited the Chile Reader, History, Culture, Politics, also published by Duke University Press in 2013. She's published numerous articles and book chapters, including her 2011 article, Women, <coughs> Children, and Domestic Labor in 19th Century um, Chile in the Hispanic American <coughs> Historical Review. Um, she's working on a book project, which I can't wait for, entitled The Birth of Uncertainty, A Global History of the Paternity Test, of which your talk comes from your new work. So today, um, uh, Professor Milanich will present The Birth of Uncertainty, A Social, Cultural, and Political History of Paternity Testing. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. I know it's a Friday morning at the end of the semester, so um, if you manage to get here, that's already a wonderful thing, and I'm very grateful for your presence. I'm very grateful for the invitation to be here with you all today and to participate in this incredible um, project, I guess, of um, thinking uh, for, for many months um, if, about kinship, families, and households. Um, I still find those topics to be um, troublingly absent or, um, you know, not so discussed as I think they should be um, in our fields, and it's really uh, nice to feel like you're coming in um, sometimes from a wilderness to speak to people who are interested in and find these topics to be important. So thank you so much for having me. In particular, thank you, Vegeta, for um, organizing my trip. It's been wonderful so far. I wish I could stay a couple extra days and have some more wine with you guys. <laughs> um, so I'm going to present um, a talk based on my book project, my ongoing book project. Um, what I'm going to leave out is all the warts. Um, I'm not going to tell you all of the troubles that I'm having, um, the methodological issues, my doubts and preoccupations, and inquietudes, as they say uh, in Spanish. Um, but I'm happy to talk through those, and indeed I hope um, I can talk through those with you in the question and answer and in the meeting with students afterwards. So I'm going to present a sort of seamless narrative where it seems, well, I don't know, maybe it won't seem seamless to you. <laughs> I guess you tell me. Um, I'm going to present uh, the book without sort of um, or the project that I'm working on without um, revealing kind of the internal architecture. So I'm not going to you, tell you all about the different source bases I'm using and the scope and all of this kind of stuff. I think some of it will become obvious as I talk, but I'm sort of going to give you the narrative. Um, and I'm happy to talk about the architecture afterwards and again the warts, which um, maybe will already be glaringly evident um, from my talk. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm working on a book called, well, it keeps changing, the title keeps changing, of course, because that's the easiest thing to change. Um, the Birth of Uncertainty, a Social, Cultural, and Political History of Paternity Testing. So I want to start off with a curious site um, that has been um, <clears throat> uh, greeted residents of New York and Boston in the last couple of years. And this curious uh, spectacle that we have seen on the streets is the so-called Who's Your Daddy truck. I don't know if you can <laughs> see um, well, but this is a Winnebago that trolls the streets of, of New York and again now Boston. Um, Providing better. Maybe better. Yeah. Okay. Um, providing DNA testing services to passerby. Um, and splashed across the truck's um, side is clearly this provocative query, who's your daddy? Um, which elicits double takes and snickers from passerby, and I get lot I've never actually seen this truck, but I get lots of texts from friends. I saw it, I saw the who's your daddy truck. Um, um, so this is a provocative query, a snicker-inducing query, um, but it is also a question, I think, of long-standing cultural, legal, political, and scientific interest. Whereas, it is said, a mother's identity can be known by the mere empirical fact of birth, if there's ever any doubt about who the mother is, fatherhood, so it is said, has been maddeningly uncertain. 
how do we know who is your fat daddy? And who has a stake in the answer to this question? So paternal uncertainty is a very old trope indeed. It recurs in medicine and law, in literature and science, and in social and political theory of the most diverse stripes. The problem of proving paternity has animated doctors in, uh, uh, since kind of ancient China. Um, it's preoccupied jurists of Roman, Islamic, Jewish, canon law. Doubting fathers populate Homer and Shakespeare, Balzac and Goethe, Hardy, Strindberg, Machado de Assis, Guy de Maupassant. Um, many of the classic 19th century social theorists, Johann Backhoffen, uh, Friedrich Engels, Lewis Henry Morgan, um, and then slightly later Freud, um, Malinowski, and other ethnographers, were centrally concerned with uncertain paternity as a kind of primordial foundation of human civilization um, and the human psyche. More recently, some sociobiologists and even some stripes of feminist thought have suggested that patriarchy derives from men's inherent inability to truly know their offspring. So enter the Who's Your Daddy truck. Today, of course, with a um, hair strand or a cheek swab, um, we can determine biological parentage with a certainty that, as all the websites tell us, exceeds 99.999%. So for many observers, more sanguine observers, of whom historians are rarely, <laughs> rarely fall in that category, <laughs> for many observers, modern biomedicine has thus laid to rest this transcendental human and societal quandary. My project asks, is that really the case? And because, of course, for all historians, the answer is going to be, you guessed it, no. <laughs> so I'm writing a, a, a book that traces the social, cultural, and political history of paternity testing in the 20th century. Um, and it narrates the emergence of the paternity test as a feature of law, of public policy, and popular culture. And we'll talk about popular culture here much today, but I kind of can't mention paternity testing without mentioning Maury Povich. So <laughs> shout out to Maury Povich. Um, he, he, he will be in, in the book. Um, and it explores how biological constructions of parentage have shaped uh, modern personhood and modern citizenship across diverse global societies. So what assumptions about kinship, descent, and identity undergirded the quest for a biological paternity test? <coughs> what new understandings of family and sexuality did the science of paternity make possible? How did the growing use of testing impact gender relations or children's rights? How did paternity testing police the boundaries not just of family but also of other collective <coughs> identities, namely race uh, and nation? So it seems to me that the answers to all of these questions depend on where we look. Different states and different societies have evinced markedly different uh, attitudes towards paternity testing, an issue that I'll come back to at the end of my talk. Um, and so a transversal question running throughout my research is, how were these new forms of knowledge received in diverse uh, global contexts over the course of the 20th century? And how did the paternity test's meaning and uses differ cross-culturally? And this is sort of actually uh, one of the warts of my project um, is thinking about how do I how do I frame that and, and what language do I use to talk about? It's not really transnationalism per se. Um, it's not international history either. Um, I'm talking about a, com a comparative perspective to some extent, um, but for now I'm sort of playing with the with the term cross cultural, which I recognize is imperfect. Um, but at any rate, th this is something that, that I can talk about further in the Q and A. But let's start with a more basic question. When did a scientific test of paternity emerge? This is the question that people always ask me when I say I'm writing this book. Okay, but, and that is, in fact, the question I started with. When did it emerge? Well, the short answer is that it's really only in the early 1980s with the development of DNA fingerprinting that there is an infallible method of determining biological kinship. But a concerted search for such a technology dates back to the 1920s. Um, when the first rudimentary techniques, um, and sometimes questionable techniques, emerged uh, to establish biological parentage. And strangely, this the, the history of these technologies, um, and again, their social and legal impact, has really not um, been told. Um, <clears throat> initially, a test of biological paternity is sought um, out as a useful tool for identifying the fathers of illegitimate children, for ferreting out <coughs> adulterous progeny. Um, Emerging techniques are used in inheritance disputes where you know, a father dies or a putative father dies and heirs appear to claim <laughs> the state. Um, it's used to identify babies accidentally swapped at birth in hospitals, um, to identify long lost uh, family members separated by war. These are cases that are obviously quite rare, 
um, but nevertheless tend to generate um, a huge amount of attention and I think telescope ideas about descent and identity and the relationship between nature and nurture. Um, but the test then moves beyond family law and filiation disputes and inheritance um, cases and sensational cases of, of identity. Um, it becomes a routine instrument of state welfare policy. And as early as the 1950s, it is incorporated uh, into immigration proceedings, becoming a litmus test, not just of kinship, but also of citizenship, which I will talk about shortly. So what's clear in all of these scenarios is that the question of who's your daddy matters, of course, to private individuals and families for re reasons both patrimonial and existential, but it also matters fundamentally to states and societies. Beginning in the 20th century, family ties in many polities have conferred access to a whole range of rights and responsibilities. Social security, pensions, welfare. Of course, children bereft of such kin ties have historically become public charges, meaning that, again, once again, kinship matters um, to states and societies and communities. Meanwhile, kinship often confers nationality or the right to migrate in the case of you know, family reunification policies. Um, in other words, while kinship is often considered a pre-modern form of association, in fact, it helps structure modern social and economic citizenship. I'm probably preaching to the converted um, when I say that in this room, but I, I um, you know, that's a point that I often try to make to, to explain to people why what I'm studying, I think, um, is important beyond Maury Povich. <laughs> um, if kinship structures citizenship, then kinship testing which offers a potentially new way of defining or knowing kinship, potentially impacts citizenship as well. So this history begins in the 1920s with the first tentative rudimentary techniques for establishing biological parentage. Um, the 1920s is, of course, a uh, perhaps not surprising moment to see these techniques emerge. This is the high, a high water moment of hereditary thinking and practice. Paternity testing first emerges as an idea thanks to new knowledge about and interest in human heredity. Um, it is, in other words, very closely intertwined with eugenics and race science, um, and that's a crucial point that I will also come back to. The possibility that science might be able to unequivocally link parent and child generates tremendous interest in scientific circles, but also in legal and popular circles, um, in the press, for example, of multiple countries. Um, as just one example, Here's an article that appeared in various newspapers in, the in 1921, how the blood test is made a love test, it's called. Um, and the article muses, apropos of some new scientific techniques and uh, very high profile <coughs> inheritance and affiliation disputes that are making the rounds of the US press, and then actually subsequently not just the US press, the article muses, Deep down in those minute eddies of the human blood, nature has placed the hallmark of every man's heredity. In his blood cells is bound up the unmistakable record of his fatherhood. So scientists research and write about and perform for the courts or sometimes private individuals paternity tests across, um, across the world, um, in the United States, in Central and Southern Europe, in Scandinavia, Russia, Latin America, especially Brazil, Argentina, Cuba, um, Egypt, and Japan have scientists working on these issues. Um, you know, here's another heads up about the warts of the project. How am I defining the scope? I can't talk about everywhere. I, uh, in an earlier iteration, used the word global history, but I've since kind of backpedaled from that description because I feel like everybody uses it, and I never really, well, some people really are talking about global history, but a lot of people aren't, but say they are. So anyway, that's uh, uh, end of parentheses. Um, and what these scientists working in these um, diverse um, uh, societies generate isn't a single test, but rather a kind of motley collection of methods and techniques, all of which are based on a basic premise. And that premise is that the truth of paternity, the truth of kinship, may be found somewhere on or in the body. That is, the bodies of progenitor and progeny carry unequivocal physical clues that reveal the kinship between them. And I argue that this is a new idea. Um, in the 19th century, paternity, in keeping with the sort of trope of unknowability, is considered not just um, not unknown, but indeed unknowable. So if you read 19th century jurists from Latin America to, uh, to France, you will find them talking about paternity as a, quote, mystery of nature, um, which is impossible to give uh, proof of any kind. 
Um, and in contrast, they always talk about paternity as in contrast to mat maternity, which is considered a material fact visible at birth subject to the senses. Paternity is not subject to the senses in the way that maternity is. So this is the way that 19th century, uh, particularly jurists, are talking about it, and it's significant that it is jurists and not scientists in the 19th century who are talking about paternity in the first place. Um, in the early 20th century, by the 1920s, however, we see paternity becoming an empirical fact, um, as well as a kind of a biophysical problem, and therefore a problem um, best suited to the expertise, not of jurists, but rather of biologists and scientists. So if nature has planted the hallmark of heredity on the body, as this article suggests, then it's really up to scientists to conduct a systematic reconnaissance of bodies and find where that hallmark <coughs> lies. And that is, in fact, exactly what they do. And I think it's worth accompanying them on their reconnaissance um, because, just to give you a sense of the kinds of techniques they come up with, uh, uh, because they, they really look in some quite unusual places. Um, and so, uh, so I think it's interesting to think about where people thought paternity lay in the human body. Uh, for example, the mouth. Um, so dentists, um, uh, or odontologists as they're, they're, they call themselves, explore, for example, how dental <coughs> morphology, the shapes of the teeth and the palatal ridges, they love palatal ridges, that is to say the bumps on the roof of your mouth, um, they, they love to think about how um, these uh, traits are hereditary and how they can reveal a relation between <coughs> progeny um, and progenitor. So the mouth. Um, in contrast, fingerprint experts, this is a pretty crappy slide, but um, this is a, a, uh, <clears throat> a, from a scientific treatise from Argentina in the 1940s on so-called hereditary dactyloscopy, dactyloscopy being this, the this science of fingerprints, which was very big in Argentina, um, as, as other places, but especially in Argentina. Fingerprint experts study the lines of the fingers and the hands um, in search of a method for reading, again, their hereditary content. So, interest in fingerprinting, not just for its purposes of individual identification, but um, for the purposes of, of hereditary tracing. Um, scientists, other scientists, re revisit old notions of family resemblance. Everybody knows that children resemble their parents, right? And they ask mm -hmm. how that basic insight can be placed at the service of a scientific uh, paternity investigation. Um, not surprisingly, the face is particularly ripe for analysis. <laughs> Um, and so we have um, this um, interesting set of photographs, um, which I like to call paternity mug shots, um, <laughs> from a uh, paternity investigation in um, São Paulo, Brazil. Um, this institute was actually the first institute in the, in the Western Hemisphere um, to begin doing systematic paternity tests for courts, uh, beginning in the 1920s and really picking up in the 1930s, well before they started in the United States, I will add. Um, and so among the, these, this institute does a whole sort of paternity workup of individuals who come before it studying fingerprints and blood, I'll talk about that momentarily, um, hereditary traits, etc. cetera. Um, but among the things they do, they always take photographs um, of the mother, child, and putative father. And if these look like police mugshots, um, that is not by chance. Um, indeed, paternity science tends to recycle methods and conventions uh, fingerprinting, anthropometry, etc., originally used for other purposes, um, like forensic identification. And so the photographic conventions used here clearly are lifted from criminal identification procedures. Um, and so scientists, paternity testers, try to make um, subjective appraisals of resemblance more scientific, often by developing um, what they consider to be objective <coughs> biometric measures of hereditary likeness. This is a pretty wild um, image from a paternity investigation that was then published from Brazil uh, in 1940, for any of you who watch Monty Python. Um, you can see some weird resemblances, right, between the head splitting open, right, the, the, um, the animation on Monty Python, this is what this reminds me of. Um, so the idea here is that um, the scientist has transposed the face of the, fa of the putative father and the son in various ways, you know, putting two hemi faces together, <laughs> splitting them apart, adding, you know, the nose of the father onto the face of the son in an effort to, um, to discern resemblance in a sort of objective way. Um, not surprisingly, scientists uh, study uh, a series of hereditary traits that they know to be hereditary. They love ears. Um, they love noses and lips, um, and they think about the possible application of um, hereditary traits, again, to paternity investigation. So here, 
in this particular study, a uh, German scientist was interested in identifying small details of the ear um, as uh, between a father and putative, uh, sorry, putative father and son, and uh, in this case he says it is uh, very likely that this man is the father based on the study of how the ear curls or whatever. There's a whole uh, vocabulary to talk about ears, um, which I'm still get, trying to get a grip on. Um, <clears throat> you may notice this is, whoa, 1963, we've hopped forward in time, and what's going on with that? Um, well, um, as I will talk about momentarily, Germany is a major center of paternity um, and hereditary um, science uh, for reasons that we can guess. Um, and it continues on, and many of these, these um, techniques continue on um, well into the 1960s. So while my project tends to focus on the upwelling of interest in these topics from the 1920s to the 1950s, in many instances these techniques are being used by scientists in labs and in courts of law um, into the 1960s. Um, and that was certainly the case um, in Germany. So clearly paternity science um, draws not just on techniques of forensic identification, but also very clearly on racial anthropology and eugenics. As we know, racial anthropologists are love noses um, and ears, um, and paternity testers do too, and there's, um, you know, there's a good reason for that. Again, I'll come back to that. So in addition to analyzing physical morphology and somatic traits, a second broad approach among paternity testers um, is to look for some sort of biochemical marker in the blood, right? Somewhere deep in the eddies of the human veins, dot, dot, dot. Um, and so blood is, not surprisingly, um, because it is um, a metaphor, right, for kinship, um, considered to be not just a metaphysical, but if indeed a physical um, marker of kinship. And so it sort of makes sense that people are looking to the blood to find, to find kinship. Um, in so doing, many of the techniques they come up with are distinctly fishy, um, I think we will agree. One of the most famous early blood tests is pioneered by a San Francisco doctor in the 1920s by the name of Albert Abrams. In the 1920s, Abrams claimed to have invented a machine that he called the oscillophore. Um, and he claimed that the oscillophore could determine paternity by measuring the vibrations of electrons in the blood of a parent and putative, putative parent and child. Um, so Abrams became extremely well known in the United States, but also in Mexico, um, in England. He, I found references to him in the Brazilian press, etc. Um, and for several years, he um, was extraordinarily well known, again, particularly in the United States, but also elsewhere. Um, a California court actually um, used his uh, the readings of the oscillophore to decide um, a number of paternity um, cases. So we laugh, and yet um, he received um, considerable um, <clears throat> attention, um, as well as, I would add, skepticism on the part of many doctors. So here I think it's worth stopping and asking um, about this project. Is, is this a book about paternity science, or is it a book about paternity pseudoscience? Um, <clears throat> clearly the idea of studying vibrating electrons in the blood with a, um, a, an, an electronic contraption in the 1920s the idea of studying teeth or fingerprints or measuring faces may strike us as rather problematic. Um, and it did even in many instances to scientists at the time. Um, it, often there are quite heated debates and disputes about which methods are the bona fide methods for discerning kinship. Um, so if we, we, we may be skeptical, but there is also a certain uh, skepticism of surrounding many of these techniques at the time. Um, but ultimately, I want to emphasize that my analysis really doesn't turn on identifying which tests really can uh, detect biological paternity. I get asked that a lot. So, but could these tests, did these tests really work? In a sense, that question <coughs> isn't so important to my project because I'm interested in how people at the time understand these tests, their popular reception, and their practical application. And their pop popular application, uh, reception and, and legal application doesn't necessarily uh, mirror in any obvious way or respond in any obvious way to what we would consider the more legitimate or less legitimate um, among these techniques. Um, and not only because uh, even methods that did not enjoy scientific uh, consensus were still used, um, but even more importantly, I think, um, I'm, I'm interested in these so-called pseudoscientific techniques as much as the scientific ones because in a sense it doesn't really matter if uh, the techniques reveal the truth of kinship. My argument is, is uh, that paternity testing doesn't uncover 
paternity in the way that 19th century jurists saw paternity as being veiled by nature and then science is going to uncover it. I'm not particularly interested in arguing how paternity testing uncovers paternity. Rather, I'm interested in thinking about how paternity testing produces a certain understanding of paternity. <clears throat> <clears throat> so I'm interested in thinking about tests, bona fide or not, um, legitimate or not, pseudoscientific or not, um, that produce um, and how they, those produce kinship as opposed to how they uncover it. So ultimately, uh, the most promising blood test, um, and certainly the most widely applied uh, one in actual practice, is um, blood testing based on inheritability of blood groups, which probably many of you are familiar with. Um, there is, uh, in the early 20th century, scientists discover the four human blood types, the fact that everybody in the world has one of these four blood types, um, and they discover as well that these laws follow um, the uh, <coughs> patterns of Mendelian heredity. Um, and that sort of basic insight that blood groups are passed from parent to child following the laws of Mendelian heredity, oops, well that's just a shot of a blood group uh, testing apparatus um, from a medical treatise uh, from England. Um, this basic insight about the laws of Mendelian heredity and their application to blood, blood groups allows for the development of deceptively simple, um, elegant tests based on um, possible and impossible combinations of heredity. And so, um, this is from a, a, an image from a US advice manual explaining to a popular readership how ABO blood types are passed. And of course, the basic insight is that if a child is, say, type O and the mother is type B, then the father cannot possibly be Mr. X because his blood type is AB and that's incompatible. So blood tests are very good at, and I should say that this, in some ways, this image is, is a little bit misleading because it's showing possible and impossible children. Usually the way jurists and scientists talk about it is possible and impossible fathers. So <laughs> the idea is we know who the mother is and we know who the child is, and that's always how the problem is constructed, of course, although of course this logic could be applied just as easily to maternity, but maternity is never understood to be a problem or a mystery. It's paternity that's the problem. Um, and so usually um, there are also sort of uh, you know, charts that lay out uh, combinations of, of blood types, and it's always the father's um, blood type that is the, I guess, dependent variable, the thing that you're trying to figure out, um, the, the possible or impossible combination. <clears throat> so ultimately, blood groups are very good at excluding impossible fathers, right? Those incompatible with the blood type of the mother and child. But they can never posit positively identify the child. Right? They can only say that Mr. Y is compatible with the mother and child because he's type B, say, but then every other man in the world who's type B is, could likewise be the father of this child. Um, so over the course of decades, as scientists discover additional serological properties um, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s, blood tests um, can narrow down with increasing precision the universe of possible fathers of a given child. Um, but they always, these, these tests always operate on this exclusionary logic. And that is a very significant fact to the history of paternity testing, as we will see. So then, you know, sort of skip ahead, uh, light years in scientific technology, we roll around, there's some important um, uh, uh, developments in the 1970s that I won't go into. But then finally in the 1980s, we have the DNA revolution, which ushers in a test deemed um, according to you know, the broadest scientific and then popular uh, consensus as infallible. So one way to tell the history of the paternity test is as a narrative of spectacular scientific discovery. And in this narrative, extraordinary advances in medical science have succeeded in resolving the millennial mystery of paternal identity. Um, again, not surprisingly for those of you <laughs> For, you know, those of us that think about kinship in social terms, um, this is a narrative that I think presents many problems. Uh, one problem is that long before DNA, long before blood tests or facial uh, measurements or fingerprinting, there were in fact ways of establishing descent. In fact, the trope of uncertainty notwithstanding, societies have long had <coughs> methods for assigning paternity. It's just that those methods have been social and legal in nature rather than kind of self-consciously scientific. The most common, perhaps, <coughs> method for assigning paternity has been marriage. In many global uh, legal traditions, ancient and modern, secular and religious, 
in Jewish law and Islamic law, canon law, Roman law, and all of its diverse modern progeny, marriage creates the presumption of paternity. That is to say, in law, the husband is always the father of his wife's children. Now, we know that that biologically doesn't necessarily have to be the case, but law makes it so. Um, marriage uh, not only makes paternity certain, it makes paternity automatic. Uh, again, this is true in diverse legal uh, traditions, and it continues to be in many, uh, for example, states in the United States today, um, very much the case as recently as 1989, the Supreme Court gave a definition of paternity in which marriage <coughs> rather than DNA results uh, um, determine the legal father of a child. In the absence of marriage, what happens? In the absence of marriage, things are a bit more complicated. <coughs> the father's identity is not immediately or automatically known, but it's not considered, for that reason, unknowable. Depending on social and cultural and legal context, paternity might be established by local hearsay, the testimony of the priest or the neighbor or the servant, by, uh, could be determined by social acts of recognition. Um, a father, a man who pays the midwife or gives a gift to the baby is, uh, may well, in a court of law, be considered uh, paternity. Paternity is something that is performed. Um, or it could be um, established by cohabitation with the mother. You lived with her during the period when we know the child was conceived, you were the father. In other words, paternity clearly is not just a biological relationship, has not historically been just a biological relationship, but a social one. And physical evidence was not necessarily the most relevant kind of evidence. And in fact, so my earlier work looked, uh, among other things, at paternity um, disputes in 19th century Chile. And in, and I wasn't interested in this issue when I, was look, when I was doing that research, but I've since gone back to my archival work of thousands of pages of testimony and questioning and investigations into uh, related to paternity uh, disputes in the 19th century. And I have found in those thousands of pages a single reference to a witness saying that, a son, that this kid must be the son of Senor X because they look similar. But physical evidence is almost entirely, references to physical resemblance, um, physical um, evidence is almost entirely absent. It's all about who bought the booties, who paid the midwife, uh -huh. who hired the wet nurse, um, who saw the parents living together, etc. <clears throat> so when paternity testing comes along, I would argue it, it upends not the great timeless mystery of paternity, what it upends are older social and legal understandings and conventions surrounding this relationship. And this leads me to one of my arguments, which is that scientific paternity testing doesn't solve old puzzles. It creates new ones, the birth of uncertainty. Biological testing has not solved how we state claims to belonging in the family or the nation. It has merely complicated how we do so. So my research is still ongoing, um, but I want to draw some tentative conclusions from what I've said so far about sort of the broad, <coughs> some of the broad arguments of this uh, of this project, or elaborating some of the ones that I've already um, alluded to. First, the history of the paternity test is not a straightforward and unidirectional story of the biologization of kinship, uh, in which new scientific constructions of paternity inexorably displace social and legal ones. In fact, scientific constructions of paternity gain traction really fitfully, and law continues to be as important as the laboratory in determining who is, who's your daddy. Here, um, I think the cross-cultural comparison is really <coughs> interesting. Um, as it turns out, some countries, Germany, Austria, um, so a number of Scandinavian countries, um, embrace paternity testing almost immediately, right in the 1920s. By 1930, there are thousands of blood tests that have been accepted in German and Austrian courts, for example, and these countries sort of adopt these technologies and never, never look back. Um, but in some other countries, um, Italy, United States, England, parts of Latin America. Um, the adoption of these technologies is very slow. How do we explain these differences? Um, I think it, it's a complicated, of course, explaining um, difference comparatively is always complicated, um, but I would point to a couple of factors. Um, differences in family law that make it easier or more difficult to um, to investigate paternity at all, to uh, you know, some, some legal systems um, categorically um, prohibit the investigation of paternity, and so you can't introduce scientific evidence into a courtroom that doesn't allow certain questions to be asked in the first place. 
Um, so, so the structure of family law and understandings of paternity in family law and in diverse legal regimes matters. Um, the contrasting status of legal medicine and the relationship of science to law, the lab and the courtroom, um, which is very different in, say, Germany from the United States, that also matters. Um, and I think finally the relative sociocultural authority of hereditary science um, uh, is, is crucial to explaining um, these different patterns of uptake and rejection of these, these technologies. So one might say that rather than asserting a single biological fatherhood, the paternity test ultimately makes visible the existence of multiple paternities, <coughs> moral paternity, legal paternity, economic paternity, social, biological paternity. Instead of displacing those older alternative constructions, paternity testing throws into sharp relief the latent tensions and contradictions that had really always existed between them. So rather than according certainty, in a sense it does precisely the opposite, making uncertain that which was certain and that which was previously settled. And I think a great example here is, is marital paternity, the best example of this kind of unseating um, of, and, and sort of increased uncertainty is marital paternity, <coughs> where once um, <clears throat> the bedrock legal principle held that marriage makes paternity certain, marriage makes the father, right, in all of these diverse uh, legal uh, traditions, now we have a biological test that makes it possible to demonstrate that actually the husband might not be the father after all. In other words, um, in this one context where paternity had been certain and inviolate, biological testing now makes it uncertain. What do we do with the biological test that shows that, oh my god, maybe the husband isn't the father after all? That is a problem for scientists and, and um, legal scholars throughout the 20th century. A recurring question uh, frames my research. Um, whose interests are served by this new technology? and by the particular constructions of paternity and kinship that it makes possible. Men's interests, women's interests, children's, uh, the interests of families or societies or states or communities, um, to the extent that we can sort of div divvy out those groups as having distinct interests in the first place. Um, I would say that the answer to that question is it depends. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> many scientists imagine that a scientific paternity <coughs> test would shift the balance of power, of, of, of gender power, um, definitively. Vindicating wronged and abandoned mothers, single mothers, um, helping innocent children abandoned by their um, ne'er-do-well fathers, and ultimately putting men on the hook. So a lot of the scientific writing on these technologies in very, very different, distinct parts of the world um, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s is all about paternity testing as a tool of, of social justice, really, and of gender justice. So this is the prediction, uh, but the actual impact of paternity science proves, I think, much more ambiguous. Actually, for most of its history, the biological paternity test, or test that it exists, permitted not paternity determination, but rather paternity exclusion. Um, and this is because of the fact that blood group testing, which um, was the most commonly used and most sort of widely applied form of testing, can only, of course, exclude impossible fathers, never identify positively um, the father. So exclusion really serves the interests of those seeking to disavow paternity, right? And while paternity disputes hinge on all, all manner of scenarios, usually, at least especially kind of earlier on, the disavowers are men. So in that regard, the, the, the technology serves um, uh, uh, the interests of, of men who would disavow their paternity. Um, I would suggest that those dynamics become considerably more complicated as time goes on. And uh, it's not always men who seek to disavow paternity. Um, often it's, it's mothers for, for various reasons. Um, so that changes. But clearly, disavowal is the, is the side that's being served by these technologies. Another argument uh, that I make in this project is that the history of paternity which is obviously a story, clearly, about gender and sexuality and kinship, is equally a story about race and citizenship. And this is perhaps what has surprised me most in my research um, and what I absolutely did not foresee um, as I delved into this first, uh, delved into this, into this topic. Um, I didn't, I don't think I, I, or I did, definitely didn't anticipate the extent to which race would be a mere constant reference, both subtle and explicit, in all discussions of paternity <coughs> testing in very diverse parts of the world. Now, maybe that shouldn't have surprised me, because after all, as I've just said, techniques of paternity science developed in, in synergy with racial science and eugenics, 
um, <clears throat> and of course family origin and racial origin rest on shared cultural idioms of blood and heredity, et cetera. So um, it, it you know, makes sense that people, when people are talking about familial ancestry, they're also talking about or would see that as somehow related to or inseparable from racial ancestry. In fact, many early tests purport to establish both parentage and racial identity. Um, take Dr. Albert <coughs> Abrams' Asilophore. He claimed to be able to distinguish not only parentage, but also um, the racial identity of different people with his uh, miraculous um, electron measuring machine. And indeed, um, for many scientists, you have the, the, the fund and jurists, um, the sense that race is, is really nature's paternity test. So the scenario of the white mother who gives birth to a child whose phenotype reveals its mixed ancestry is a constant trope in discussions of paternity testing. That's true in places like South Africa and Cuba and the United States, but it's also true in places like Italy, where one might assume a very different history of race, I mean, to put it in the most kind of simplistic terms, uh, but this trope nevertheless recurs um, in Argentina and Brazil in many places. Um, and in fact, in some legal jurisdictions, um, some jurisdictions prove to be rather more suspicious of tests based on physical resemblance. But even in jurisdictions that reject tests based on physical resemblance, there's always an exception in cases where the races of the putative parents are different. So by the virtue of the fact that you have two parents of two different races or ethnicities and a child that is somehow a mix of the third, somehow that, that's, you know, that's race is nature's paternity test, though there we can, um, uh, use physical resemblance to make a claim about uh, who the father is. As I mentioned earlier, Germany and Austria are early and enthusiastic adopters of blood and morphology tests in cases of disputed paternity, um, as early as the kind of the mid 1920s. Um, a decade later, these same uh, uh, techniques, performed by the same scientists in the very same research institutes, would be put to a very different uh, but related use, namely racial ancestry testing. So these were proceedings in which Jews sought to challenge their racial, racial classification by demonstrating themselves to be only half Jewish or, or not Jewish at all. So Germans classified as Jews, I'm not actually Jewish, I'm only half Jewish, which gives you a different legal status, or I, I'm actually not Jewish at all. I've been mis mistaken for uh, uh, a Jew, but I'm actually fully Aryan on both sides of my family. And in practice, what this means is that paternity tests are often being invoked to disavow People are using paternity tests to disavow any biological relation with their Jewish fathers. I'm not really the child of my mother's husband. I'm the child of the Aryan gardener with whom she had an affair. So I'm actually mixed. I'm not, I'm not a full-blooded Jew. Um, so the Nazi, the National Socialist racial state uses paternity testing as a tool of racial classification and in turn those classified as Jews use paternity tests in order to, to reclassify themselves racially. So this is pretty, I think, a, one of the clearer examples of where paternity testing and race and racial testing are, are absolutely inextricably linked. The ra racialization of paternity science is also evident um, in its migration from family law to immigration law. In the 1950s, the US uh, Immigration and Naturalization Service began requiring paternity tests of the prospective sons, oh, sorry, the prospective immigrants from uh, China who were seeking entry into the United States um, as the Chinese-born sons of American citizens. That makes sense. So people who are making a claim to entry in the United States <coughs> based on their status as sons of Chinese-American citizens. Um, significantly, this policy of using uh, or of requiring um, biological testing to establish kinship is only applied to persons of Chinese descent. Now, what uh, the INS is trying to avoid here is first fraud, um, you know, this kind of long history of um, so-called paper sons of, of individuals um, uh, Chinese or Chinese descent um, seeking entry into the United States as the sons of Chinese American um, uh, uh, citizens. So part of this is about avoiding fraud, but in the, uh, you know, heated and heady environment of the Cold War 1950s, there is also considered to be a national security um, dimension to this problem. So the problem is not just fraud, but that communist imposters are seeking to infiltrate um, the United States by posing as the sons of Chinese American citizens. 
So we will use a blood test to root out those communist imposters. So uh -huh. in a sense, blood testing becomes a test in a way, not just of kinship, but of communism. Um, today, you know, that sounds like a crazy thing. Uh -huh. God, God, the 1950s, thank God we don't live there anymore. Well, today DNA <laughs> testing is used in over a dozen countries um, on a regular basis to verify the family claims of would-be immigrants and refugees. Um, I was just reading the other day about uh, Central American refugee children are being subjected to DNA tests to, so that they can establish right, their kinship with um, individuals in the United States with whom they are being uh, reunited. Um, in many countries, in fact, paternity as defined in family law is, an entirely different, is entirely different from how it is defined for the purposes of immigration and citizenship. Um, and that seems significant. Um, so what we can draw from these examples is that paternity testing performs really the work of boundary making. It regulates the boundaries of the family, but it also regulates in a very fundamental way the physical and metaphysical boundaries of the nation. Paternity tests do not just test paternity, I think it's clear. In Germany in the 1930s and 40s, they separate Jews from Aryans. In the United States in the 1950s, they purport to identify communists, Chinese communists. A final hypothesis. Um, that I want to present, which I think takes this project up to the present. Um, some global <laughs> histories of family and childhood have emphasized cross-cultural convergence towards modern norms and values over the course of the 20th century. I'm thinking of the work of Peter Stearns, for example. It seems to me that the history of paternity is clearly one, rather, of divergence and variation. In particular, I'm struck by the starkly divergent ways that contemporary societies, not just societies in the past, but also contemporary <laughs> societies, have responded to the possibilities and dilemmas of paternity science. And I want to conclude here with three brief examples to give you a sense of how divergent different uh, those kind of responses are. First, we have the example of France. France prohibits outright, by law, any paternity testing except by order of a court. You, that is to say, you are a putative father or a child or a mother, you want to know who the father of child X is, you do not have a right to uh, conduct that biological uh, test, even though the technology is clearly available, um, and people without the order of a court, without a judge's order, um, and people who attempt to, there is a, a very sort of lively trade of people who, are, who try and subvert this um, regulation by sending their cheek swabs and, and uh, blood and hair uh, through the mail to Swiss and Spanish <coughs> laboratories, um, again, in an effort to circumvent this, this ban. Um, who is the father in France? Well, how, did, how France answers that question is, well, that's not a question that individual parents or children have an unencumbered right uh, to ask, right? The state controls who, who and in what conditions um, you can ask that question or know the answer to that question. So that's France. Second example, Latin America. Latin America has a very long history of non-marital unions, uh, low rates of marriage, uh, uh, large numbers of children born out of wedlock, illegitimate and law. Um, and it also has um, a long history of prohibiting paternity investigation. Um, that history is crucially relevant, I think, to how the DNA paternity test is perceived and used in Latin America today. Um, in many countries of Latin America, <coughs> including in Costa Rica, uh, this, is, this is an example from Costa Rica, but there I could uh, come up with others from Brazil or Chile, there exist public education campaigns that urge that in a democratic nation, all children have an un inalienable right to a paternal identity. Particularly in post-dictatorship um, countries, that's not the case of Costa Rica, but it is, in, for example, very clearly in Brazil and Chile and Argentina, um, <clears throat> paternity testing is couched within a kind of hegemonic language of democratic citizenship and human rights. Um, this is an inalienable right that women have to support from their male partner and that children have to an identity and to material support. So paternity testing is seen as a tool of social justice, a tool of feminist social policy, welfare policy, a tool of anti-poverty policy. Paternity tests are paid for, which are expensive, are paid for by the state, therefore. Um, who is your father? Well, in many places in Latin America, the question, that question, is uh, one of, again, justice and human rights, and the state, rather than controlling who has the answer to that question, will help you find the answer um, by helping you pay for the test. Finally, we have the case of the United States. 
U.S. law, state laws are a morass of contradictory <coughs> mandates. I, 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 this book is not about U.S. history, but I sometimes feel bad for those of you who work on the U.S. because I find it so uh, difficult to uh, um, uh, reconcile, you know, some, some thinking about US, U.S. American law. Um, how do you reconcile, how do you talk about U.S. American law when every state has a different rule? Anyway, <laughs> state law is a morass of contradictory mandates on the status of scientific paternity testing. In Kansas and New Jersey, legislators have introduced bills calling for the mandatory DNA testing of all children at birth in order to determine whether the guy on the birth certificate is really the father. Um, meanwhile, of course, here you can buy a paternity test from your local pharmacy for as little as $70. Um, and of course, if you can't make it to the pharmacy, there's always that mobile uh, paternity <laughs> testing truck. So to the answer, who is your father in the United States, we respond, well, that's not a question for the state to answer. That is a question, right? Um, that is an individual's right to know. Um, and thanks to the commercialization of, the, of these genetic technologies, um, we can all go to the store or the lab and pay for the answer uh, to that question. So ultimately, I think, and to conclude, um, I think a history, and this is going to be kind of a like conclusion, but <laughs> no, I'm not um, ultimately, I think a historical perspective on the evolution of paternity science can help us to make sense of the contemporary ethical, legal, social quandaries, um, and these the dizzying array of responses that <clears throat> societies around the world have generated uh, to resolve them. I will stop there. Thank you. There are some paternity tests that purport, most, most, I would say most people working at this time see these technologies as um, applicable to either maternity or paternity, but socially right. speaking, paternity is always the question, therefore that's why we need to do procurement. There are, however, a few, I'm thinking of one um, Prussian guy who comes up with a test and he claims that a blood test where you shoot a light through uh, a spectroscope through blood and look at the colors um, um, can reveal paternity because the albumin of the sperm of the father is basically uh, inoculates the blood of the mother and you can see that through this light. So there's an instance where there's a very distinct biological uh, sexual difference uh, being purported Generally speaking, though, the biology assumes gender symmetry, right. and it's the law that assumes gender asymmetry. Very yeah, but that's a that's a great question. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, and I, I kept being curious whether you thought about how, to what extent at all, the history of paternity testing correlates with the history of the criminalization of adultery. Because um, adultery, right, obviously was always the one act that did undermine the marriage is the marriage creates paternity. And this mm -hmm. is something that's been recognized by societies all over the place. Why it is why adultery was criminalized for so long. I mean, is it still criminal? I'm not even sure. It could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it in no. Georgia or something? I mean, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. Well, and for a long time it was criminalized for, for, for women, but not for men. Right, right? exactly. I mean, exactly. men should have been exactly. 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 And I think it's Roman. So, right. But so I was just curious <laughs> if you thought about, I mean, is there any relationship between these things at all? Yeah. Does, does attitudes towards adultery change yeah. now that we can be quote unquote certain of yes. that paternity? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, what strikes me <clears throat> is while indeed 
uh, paternity testing has you know, unseated the presumption of paternity on the part of the father. Um, the extent to which it has done so is, is, is the, the, the extent that to which it has not done so is surprising to me. That is to say, again, we have a Supreme Court case as recently as 1989 in which actually um, Anton Scalia, interestingly, says that a man who is the biological father by the DNA test, the, the adulterous lover of the mother, is not the father of the child because the child has been born in marriage, the, the mother is still married to this other guy, and therefore the law states that this <coughs> child is not illegitimate. She is the legitimate progeny of her mother and father. So um, there is, a, in that case, he, you know, the, the interpretation of that case is he is trying to construct a traditional family, mother, father, child, right? Um, and it doesn't really matter if there's biological congruity with that family as long as that <coughs> traditional family exists. So there the adultery is effaced, um, and the biological incongruity of the child and the, pu and the husband is, is effaced. Um, I can think of another example, um, there's a, a, and this relates to race, one of my chapters is going to deal with this incredible case um, in Italy in the post-war period in which a white uh, Italian wife gives birth to a mulatto child, a mulatino as he's called, um, and the, her white Italian husband says this child is not my child. Um, there are African American servicemen who are um, uh, stationed in the area, and there are, in fact, many children born of relations with uh, American GIs, both African American and not, uh, in this in this region, uh, in the north of Italy. And the uh, the husband sues it's for disavowal of paternity and adultery and lots of other things, and the court finds him to be the father of the child. It will not undermine the presumption of marriage. It will not recognize uh, their, uh, you know, adultery. Um, you are the legal child, father of this child, regardless of, of nature's paternity test, which tells us that you cannot possibly biologically be the father. So actually what's striking to me is the extent to which the presumption of, yeah, it doesn't. And, and the one, I would say the one massive, ex, the extreme, uh, um, uh, what's the word? The no, the one. Um, oh my God, I lost my mind. Um, exception <laughs> to that rule. The exception to that rule is Germany. Um, good Nazi race scientists are interested in who the biological father is. They dispense with this legal fiction very quickly um, and make and they change the law so it makes it much easier to um, to uh, challenge paternity and marriage because it's, it is in societies. It is the interest <coughs> of society to know. Is that person Jewish or no? So then the criminalization of adultery, when does that end? Do you know? I mean, the criminalization of yeah, adultery? adultery. I mean, so that depends it, on where, yeah. Yeah, so I guess it, then it, it almost it ceases to be in part about paternity and is entirely moral. I mean, so, because obviously if you're not, I mean, the reason why it was criminalized for so long was because of, in part, because of the concern over paternity. Right. And so if now we know it's not, like yes. adultery seems to be no longer a factor. I think right. yet it's still on the books. One wonder. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't, don't know if it, I don't it. think it is. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it is some places, but, um, but I don't know. Do you know about? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Only in the U.S. Yeah. That's right. The world is still criminalized. So it's sort of interesting. So I guess it's just entirely immoral. Right. And again, about women. Right, 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 right. And therefore about paternity as yeah. opposed to, yes. Yes, we have thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, there are a number of questions that come to mind, but and this is rather ill form, but I'm thinking of three different examples I wanted to comment on or if you thought about this. Or um, one one that you mentioned I wanted to discuss is one. Um, in immigration law, I know that for um I have a friend who was an immigrant from Mars for some time and said what was um, completely frustrating about kinship and whether or not people were actual biological children or family members of the people who were coming over for refugee status or whatever the case may be. So I wonder if you thought about that at all, how paternity testing operates there and establishing legal claim to children or family members. Um, the second case was um, going back to what 
and his father had children that were living out here. Um, and that's outside the record. Yeah. Um, yeah, great questions. And I think, I mean, both of those questions, in a sense, point to the disconnect between a biological notion of kinship mobilized by paternity testing and vernacular kinship forms, whether African or Latin American or in lots of other places in the world that do not necessarily obey um, an exclusive biological logic. So the case of African um, kinship is, is, is really, or, or immigrants is really interesting, um, and it is absolutely a problem, and this is one of the critiques that's made of the use of DNA testing in immigration law, is you are you know, using a very narrow uh, definition of what you consider kin to be. Um, for individuals who may not come from societies where that's the that's their sort of reigning logic, um, there was an article a number of years ago on the front page of the New York Times precisely about this problem um, with African um, an African I think a Ghanaian family um, where you know there are foster children who may not be biologically related but are no less children of their of their families. Um, I think a particularly interesting example here is France, where um, France uh, adopts a in civil law. You know, no paternity testing allowed for you know uh, in, in civil law for a French citizen who wants to know whether he's the father or not. Um, but in 2007 or 8, uh, Sarkozy uh, promulgated a law which required DNA paternity testing in the case of um, North African immigrants coming to France. So like, which is it? Is it biological or is it not? Well, clearly here is a great example of where immigration law, and paternity and immigration law and paternity and civil law for citizens are, are constructed as two entirely different uh, uh, entities um, and, and contradictory, um, inconsistent, hypocritical. Um, so I think that that's absolutely a critical um, question. And as for Latin America, absolutely, um, I think a similar problem at stake um, uh, in, in many instances, mothers want uh, the biological father identified and um, on, on the hook, as it were, materially or socially or emotionally for that child. Um, but what happens in um, places with, you know, sort of practices of serial um, monogamy or the so-called casa chica, um, it's very clear that some mothers do not and, and indeed actively avoid, you know, these kind of public education campaigns. I'm not interested in having his um, name inscribed on the, on the birth certificate. He has another family or he's a loser or I have another uh, man who is acting socially as the father. Once again, the problem of very narrowly defining paternity uh, in a way that could impoverish as much as it empowers. Yeah. I thought it was so interesting what you brought up about how these paternity conversations impact the deep FedEx conversations and citizenship conversation. And I was curious, since you mentioned that these first emerged in the 1920s, were they also interacting with the arguments about like European immigrants and whether they were really white and how white are they and can they really become citizens and is their blood going to like pollute the Anglo-Saxon blood of the nation and all that stuff? Yeah, great question. I mean, um, I would say, I, I'm not sure that I found direct links, but I think that the sort of general ethos of the moment is is very much there. I mean, it's hard to, uh, uh, it, it's not by chance that, you know, Dr. Albert Abrams with his oscillophore is mm -hmm. famous in precisely the years when the U.S. is promulgating, you know, the immigration restrictions um, <coughs> of the mid-1920s. That can't be by chance that he's talking about blood and that he claims to be able to, uh, to um, <clears throat> establish distinctions between bloods. And in fact, in kind of the most famous case um, that launches his star um, in the US press and then the international press, the case involves uh, two parents married. The father claims that he's not the father of the child. The mother is identified as Spanish, I guess from Spain, although it's not clear. Um, this is in San Francisco. The father is Italian, is an Italian immigrant, and he claims that his blood test can show that the blood of the father is Italian blood. And he actually has this whole, it's three-fourths ohms of Italian and one-eighth <laughs> ohm of Hungarian. And like, so, so actually, thinking through it, that maybe that is a, um, a connection. But I think that it's sort of, certainly the more general eugenic um, ethos is very much there. And in fact, um, some of the better-known uh, eugenicists um, Davenport, for example, Charles Davenport, um, talk about paternity testing and apparently our um, people approach the eugenics records office when they have paternity disputes and ask them if they can help out with, you know, studying ear shape or whatever. Um, so there's some pretty clear links there. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, so we can think of lots of reasons that a uh, mother might want to know, the, you know, have a paternity test, or a, a putative father might want to know, in terms of di disavowing um, paternity, but I'm wondering about, and I imagine this is quite recent, if at all, your research has uh, discovered any, like a conversation about potential fathers wanting a paternity test for uh, paternal rights to a child. Absolutely, absolutely. The case in the, 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 the 1989 Supreme Court case is one in which yeah, that's the father is yeah. attempting to assert his paternal rights um, and custody rights over this child based on his biological status. So that's absolutely the case. Um, and so, you know, while the kind of classic trope is the, the abandoned woman mm -hmm. and the, um, the slick guy who wants to get out of um, the, you know, being named the father, in fact, that turns out to be, you know, a simplification, <laughs> maybe not surprisingly. So there are absolutely cases where, um, you know, fathers are seeking um, not just, they're, they're seeking rights um, to custody and contact, et cetera. Is, is the law, like, open to that so far and if in yeah. various places? Um, or? Yeah. <laughs> the answer to that, even for the U.S., is it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that if you look at um, court cases even from, like, the 1990s, <clears throat> um, and I'm certainly not an expert in this, but um, the basic story seems to be sometimes courts um, rely on, you know, it, it make a decision that seems congruous with biology, but sometimes they don't. Um, and it seems like, I, I'm thinking of one article in, in particular that I just assigned to my class a couple weeks ago that we read, um, the basic logic of these seeming contradictory um, court cases in which sometimes it's the biological father, but sometimes the social father who is, um, who is awarded rights and responsibility, the paternal identity, really depends on um, the court's uh, attempt to construct a traditional family. So I'm thinking here of the 1989 yeah. case. It's really, that's ultimately the logic. They're willing to disavow biology when it serves them, <laughs> if it creates a traditional, what they consider a traditional nuclear family. And they are willing also to invoke biology if it serves that purpose. So there is a logic other than biology, per se, that seems to motivate courts and construction of paternity post-DNA. Have you thought about how um, popular genealogy figures yeah. into this? And I'm thinking, obviously, about Ancestry.com right now, which, <laughs> as you, I'm sure you know, offers DNA testing. Yes. And it's my understanding, by the way, that African Americans are the most uh, frequent users of that service, yes. which connects again with race. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, I, I, I don't know what to say except I find them fascinating. And I'm thinking about like all the stuff I have to put in the epilogue, <laughs> or a conclusion, or chapter eight, I don't know, ten. Um, and one of them is this this um, this interest in ancestry, which is really fascinating. Um, one of the things that I haven't done, but that I really want to do, um, especially for the end part of the book, is um, contact uh, DNA testing uh, uh, facilities um, and interview. There are these, it's, as far as I can discern there are these large, um, often multinational um, genetic testing um, entities which operate labs in different countries in the world. There's a very interesting internet kind of transnational dimension to this. Um, and uh, you know they're all over the web and they do both ancestry testing or DNA paternity testing. Some of them specialize in one or the other. Um, one of the interesting things that I, this is not answering your question at all, although it is kind of related, is that apparently some of the largest um, DNA testing um, companies are closely associated with or owned by or have CEOs who are Mormons. That's right. Well, that's right. Which makes sense. Mm -hmm. So move, moving from um, a, a, a certain kind of genealogical research to another kind of genealogical <laughs> research. Um, and that's, that's really <coughs> fascinating, I think, uh, and deserves probably yeah, someone, a whole book. If anyone needs a dissertation in <laughs> anthropology <laughs> on Mormon genealogy and the, the, the DNA archives uh, connection, there is something going on there. Yeah. Yeah. Two actual totally unrelated areas where I'm wondering if you've seen any connection here. Um, one is, uh, is, is related to Jim Crow laws and here's the one drop rule. We've got presumably people who are trying to prove that they, or want to prove that they do not have 
or or conversely, <coughs> if you want to prove that they do have the one drop of of um, African American blood. The second is again utterly unrelated. But has there been any how has paternity has there been any related connection in your research that you found between paternity testing and adopted children looking for their natural families? Paternity testing involving adopted children looking for their natural yeah, families. So those are two completely separate things. Yeah. Like, and you have on either of those your research is intersected with that. Yeah, good question. Um, there are um, so on the one drop rule, let's see. <coughs> I mean, again, many of the, these tests, um, especially blood tests, purport to, um, you know, they find race and family in the blood. Um, and they purport to be able to, again, distinguish uh, racial identity or establish racial identity as well as um, uh, paternity or kinship identity. And I guess maybe something that's interesting is that those tests are not just coming out of the United States. That's not just Albert Abrams in San Francisco, but it's, you know, the Prussian guy and uh, a, a Russian um, scientist who claims he can distinguish Russian from Jewish blood, uh, also in the 1920s. So I feel like there, I mean, there is absolutely something there, and and it is also bigger um, than, not surprisingly, um, than than the U.S.'s particular construction of uh, blood and race. Um, so you know, he, how do you talk about? Is it is it? It's clearly not the same everywhere, um, but there is also. Um, a common thread. So this is one of the challenges that I'm ha having as I think comparatively is, you know, lumber and separator, whatever that dynamic is. Um, is this all the, all of a piece or is it actually the real story about the distinctions despite the symmetries across Russia and the United States? Um, so that's not really an answer to your question, um, but that, that's what comes to mind. Um, for ch adopted children separated from their parents, I can't think of, um, it's, there are certainly many instances of children who have been lost or swapped at birth or kidnapped by gypsies. That's, a, that's, that's one that occurs. Who knew there were so many children kidnapped by gypsies um, in the United States in like the 1940s. Um, <laughs> um, so there is a lot of that. Interestingly, adoption, uh, that, as I think about it, is not part of the story, but that's actually probably significant. I haven't thought about it. Um, I suspect that says something about how adoption, you know, people were thinking about adoption um, in the United States in this period. Um, but no, adoption has not come up as a, as a sort of classic scenario. There are uh, examples of people who have been separated from their family, but often adults, um, by war. The, you know, long lost, missing in action soldier in World War I who shows up on his doorstep 15 years later, is he, st is he really the same guy or not? Um, one of the ways of determining that is actually through paternity testing. Is he the father of the children that were left behind? There's a famous case in Italy that happens uh, in the 1920s and 30s with that scenario. Um, so there is, you know, finding missing family members or reconnecting family members is certainly a trope, but adoption per se, I have not not heard about it all, but I, I have to think about that more because that seems like an important omission. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if in the in the projects you think about changing notions of personhood and how this question of paternity might um, be shifting in terms of the child wanting to know who their father, who their daddy is. So when you ask about what that stake in asking the question mm -hmm. who's your daddy mm -hmm. the, the child also has a stake and certainly there are different notions about inherent personhood that shift mm -hmm. with changes in you know mm -hmm. scientific discourses and i'm just curious if you see that coming out not in the pop culture stuff because clearly that's going to be sort of infused in all the pop culture stuff but yeah in the material you're reviewing for this talk how does it shift in the 20s to the 80s how we think about who we are and, and specifically the child's desire, whether the child is, is younger or older, the child's desire to have a better sense of who they are, um, does that come <coughs> out at all? Yeah, that's a great question. And does it change? I feel like um, it's, a, it's a complicated question because on the one hand, there's this total biologization of identity in which who we are is <coughs> where we came. And so in these kind of narratives on Ancestry.com, I was just talking to somebody the other day about it who was 
uh, who was reading um, uh, you know, one of these uh, personal narratives on one of these websites. I always thought I was German. I loved wearing Niederhosen. And then, oh my god, I did one of these tests and I found out I was Scottish. <laughs> now I'm wearing a kilt. And I, now suddenly I feel, you know. So there's a total biologization sort of ex post of who I am and, 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 I, and, and you know, the, the sort of debates about um, do, you know, I, I'm searching for, and I've read lots of, I've spent way too much time on these websites. Um, you know, I, I, I was, I'm the child of a donor insemination, an anonymous donor, and I want to know who the donor, and I've never felt complete without this biological knowledge. So on the one hand, you have that, which and when seems, that, when, that when does that, I think that's, that well, I mean, especially with DNA, but there are certainly couched in other terms much earlier. I mean, because who you are, you are your race, you are your family, um, and I think that there's a, there's a, uh, it, it, I'm not sure that it's couched in, in terms of personhood in these kind of existential terms. Um, it's certainly not as freighted, but people are, I'm trying to think of an example, um, which I can't think of off the top of my head, but it's not an entirely foreign idea. Um, it becomes maybe sort of more congealed with DNA. Um, well, and it seems then, that your work yeah. has a lot to contribute, though, to, the, to changing notions about personhood and subjectivity through the 20th century. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all, it's all you know, yeah. in there. Um, yeah. I don't know if you really take yeah. that up in your book, but it, I mean, there's so much to draw out. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I guess, Especially you know... Especially if there's a shift from sort of, you know, the race of the early 20th century to this idea about individuality later in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. But your examples are sort of showing yeah. that shift. Yeah, you know, I will have to. I mean, in that, that whole Turning Court reality show, you know, in yeah. the 1920s, it's fascinating. It's yeah. really great work. Yeah, that's a great question. Because, And I guess, you know, on the one hand, we do have that sort of biologization and this notion that, you know, who you are now more than ever is in the blood. And yet, on the other hand, you have a whole kind of counter discourse about families are the things that we make and. Um, you know, we have we recognize today alternative modes of family formation and other kinds of relatedness, and so there's a, there's a whole counter discourse that debiologizes identity as well. Um, and you know, I, I'm I'm not sure we know how to reconcile the two, and are are they somehow at odds with one another? Right, the idea that you know, children are adopted and they you know have one mother, they have two mothers, they have two fathers, you know, that whole sort of um, discourse about you know family as choice rather than biology um, would seem to run counter to those idea notions of, of biology is so central to subjecthood. But I don't know how to yeah I, I don't know how to reconcile them. But it's a great question. Yeah. Um, related related to that actually, um, have you come across any cases where there were same sex couples involved in these kind of fraternity suits or like gender, like, variant people involved, and, like, has gender played a role in some of these cases of paternity testing? Yeah, that's a great question, and the short answer is no, never. Um, no. I can finally answer a question definitively. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, certainly not, you know, until very recently. Um, um, and that doesn't mean, obviously, that doesn't mean they're not there. It means they're not being talked about in, you know, that's not the way kinship is being talked about by jurists and scientists or the press uh, in, you know, in this earlier period. So, yes? I was thinking um, that, you know, a lot of the, the, the chronology of your, of your talk overlaps with, like, technology about fetuses. And forgive mm -hmm. me for, like, not, I don't, I don't, I know that you can do a paternity test with like a living child, you do like a swab or a blood test or whatever. Mm -hmm. What kind of technologies are there to like measure paternity in the womb? Yeah. And are there, and even those technologies are like bunk. Do people think they have technologies? Yeah. And how does it relate to the debates about abortion a, and termination? Yeah. And Great question. Um, well, the, the technology to test the paternity of a fetus actually is really recent. Like since I started this, uh, Project uh, maybe like two years ago, there was a little, you know blip in the news about new techniques, which have now been all taken up by all the websites. You can even find out before the baby is born. 
um, and there's been, then that, that's been debated, like if you could find out that the embryo is not the child of X, but is of Y, will that make people choose abortion? So um, that's, it's a, uh, as everything having to do with fetuses, um, a very <laughs> freighted and polemical technology. Um, but I have never heard people talking about testing fetuses before now, um, before DNA. That's true. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I had other questions that sort of gesture to this, but I wonder if you can correlate uh, changes in legal architecture around um, non biologic vernacular sort of elective kinship in response to this biologization of kinship that you see coming out of paternity tests, and if so, are there kind of, is there sort of a typology you can give of <coughs> legal responses to protecting, expanding, safeguarding uh, rights associated with elective kinship? Yeah, great question. So, I would say that most legal architectures are not very responsive okay. to vernacular kinship in general, and yeah. in the I mean, world sort of the in the 20th century, game, but, but maybe uh, maybe a sort of counter example would be, um, or an exception, I found, I found that word, mm -hmm. uh, is um, the recognition of non-marital children, illegitimate children. So over the course of the 20th century, there is an expanding, pretty pretty clear narrative of expansion of rights of so-called illegitimate children in terms of their patrimonial and material rights, alimentary rights. Um, across Europe and the US and Latin America over the course of the 20th century. So that's a pretty clear like uh, unidirectional, I can finally say something about the whole world. Because uh, there are very few, things, very, very few things you can actually say about everywhere. Um, so, um, so expanding rights for illegitimate children, how does that relate to biological paternity testing? Um, well, it does in the sense that um, I mean, you can't, I mean, the example of Latin America is a very good one. You can't test paternity if you don't allow paternity investigation. Um, and one of the things that strikes me about these technologies is that, on the one hand, I think we are sort of pre-programmed as anthropologists and historians, um, or whatever other fields we're from, from gender studies um, folks, to see um, blood biological tests as they they reify, they naturalize in ways, kinship in ways that we find um, noxious. Um, but in fact, in certain legal circumstances, um, a biological um, notion of paternity actually turns out to be pretty progressive. Um, and that is the case in Latin America where historically um, only the children of married fathers had rights. And that's a, that's a kind of generalization, but let's just take it at that. I can't have no time to nuance it. Um, but if you can show, uh, if by, so by adopting a biological um, definition of kinship, you are suggesting that all children, regardless of the circumstances of their birth, have a right to X, Y, and Z. That's a pretty, that's a progressive stance. If you have previously defined paternity as only, um, you know, uh, the privilege of marriage. Um, so in that instance, I feel like biological testing um, works on the side of sort of children's rights and a progressive notion of, uh, of rights, et cetera. And I think that the two are, you know, again, related. The expansion of uh, uh, recognition of vernacular forms of non-formal family formation on the one hand and the, the kind of march of biological testing. Well, <laughs> <laughs> to talk, it made me think of so many different things in history that um, I would love to chat more about. But um, one of the things that I was wondering, you, you didn't say anything about the church mm. as um, as a, 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 a questions of it's helping to address questions of maternity. And, and here I want to give sort of a, um, <coughs> a ball of promotion to one of our students. Um, uh, Noel Holt, who did a dissertation a couple years ago um, about um, women in, in antebellum Louisiana, um, women of mixed ancestry, African American and white, who had relationships with white men, and by law they were unallowed. They were, uh, you know, it was illegal for them to marry. So sometimes <coughs> Noel found they would use the, the church record 
to establish paternity, mm. that um, uh, they, they would have the children baptized, and in the baptismal record it would say, so-and-so is the father. And then mm -hmm. later on, if the, the father dies and, and the, the inheritance is challenged by a white relative, they then Wait pull this the out and say, the church so says, you know, this indicates. Have you come across so any anything related to church or anything? Yeah, <laughs> that is a great question. That's really interesting. Um, the church is, the Catholic church specifically, um, is weirdly silent about paternity testing. I have gone through, you know, issue after issue of um, Catholic medical, Catholic legal, Catholic social journals. They talk endlessly about abortion. Huh. They talk endlessly about um, contraception. They talk endlessly about donor insemination, artificial insemination. Is um, inseminating a married woman with someone else's sperm adultery or no? They spend a lot of ink on that question. They do not talk about paternity testing, or they, very very little. And you know, the the only sort of hypothesis that I can come up with is this question of destabilizing marriage. The church loves marriage. Um, paternity testing does not necessarily love marriage. We don't even want to go there. And I found some kind of self-identifying Catholic uh, scientists in Italy, for example, who say something along those lines. Um, this is a dangerous technology. It can delegitimate children. It can break apart marriages. It can result in the deaths of women, of adulterous wives when their husbands find out. It must be used with great caution. Um, and there is a certain, um, again, some of them are kind of self-identified Catholics. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I think it, it um, fits very well with what, at least what I've seen in Latin America working in the 19th century, that the church is um, very, cons is, it has no problem with private secrets and sort of keeping morality under wrap. And part of what it means to be a moral society is to recognize that immoralities happen, but to keep them private. And so it is the scientist's duty not to share information that could blow apart um, a, a family and cause public scandal. You know, not, that's in the 1950s, not in the 1850s, finding those discourses. But as a sort of entity, I'm not finding the church saying, even as it's talking endlessly about reproductive technologies and reproductive politics in, um, like, especially like the 1950s, they're, they're talking about donor insemination all over the place. Um, they're not talking about these technologies. <coughs> Again, the silences are always the adoption, same-sex uh, couples, the church. The, the silences are clearly as telling as what we find right, in the archives. Well, I think that was our last question. So, <laughs> so thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs>